All right, I got a lot to do here, and Ryan's taking up too much of my time, and he's made fun of my shirt, so let's get straight to the Word. We're going to go to Psalms 103, Psalms 103, verses 8 through 12. When you get there, say amen. That's the good Christians in the back. They got there quick. <laughs> they got it memorized. I still hear pages being flipped. Amen when you get there. All right. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us, nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all of our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far as us, as far from us as the east is from the west. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I praise you and thank you so much, God, that this church, it is just amazing to walk up, come in the doors, and feel your presence every Sunday. Father, I praise you for being here. We invite you in every Sunday. That's the first thing I do, Father, when I get here. I, I want you here. We want your presence felt. God, today I feel it. I want to thank you for my brother Ryan that's come up to talk about the orphanage. And God, I just ask that you continue to bless that ministry. Uh, I know that you will uh, because their heart's in the right place. And uh, Father, just continue to keep them in your favor. And uh, God, today I, I ask that each and every person that's in this room has an open heart and an open mind for the message that you have prepared for me to give that is yours. God, this is your message. I ask that you get me out of the way. Father, in this moment, I ask that you anoint me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, that you take all my pride, selfishness, stress, anger, doubt. God, I ask that you take it all away and you cast it into the sea and you replace it with your boldness, your love, your grace, and your mercy, Father. I ask these things in your name. Help us to love, help us to laugh, help us to forgive. Amen. There's a man and he's arrested for multiple counts of fraud. He's hurt many people with his actions. After a short amount of time, the court date arrives. After days of hearings, the jury is ready to decide this person's verdict. Right before the jury goes back to make their decision and the fate of this man, the judge asks him, is there anything that you want to say to the court? The man then looks at the jury he looks at all the people in the courtroom, some of which are the people that he had wronged. But then right before he says something, he looks at the people directly sitting behind him. And it's his family. And all he can get out is one word. Mercy. Today's title is to show mercy. At some point in our life, we want justice for someone who's wronged us, right? It's okay to say that. It's okay to say that. But when the table's flipped around on us, we want mercy. Make no mistake about it, our God is a just God, but thank goodness he is also a merciful God. One of the greatest benefits of serving God is that we will extend, or excuse me, he will extend mercy to us. The problem is, is the world that we live in today has made showing mercy almost like a weakness. That's the problem. We've got too many people that want to inflict justice 24-7 when there is times that God wants us to show mercy. I need you to understand that mercy is a characteristic of meekness. And if y'all remember a few weeks back, I preached on meekness is not weakness. Showing mercy can be so strong. We'll get into some of that here in a minute. I've got some stories for that. I tell you, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and, okay. There's a couple that used to do business with me at the George store. This man came in, he bought an engagement ring for his wife. At the time, this was right after we first opened, we now have a secondary finance company that we use 
to finance everybody. So that way I get my money up front. I don't have to collect it or anything like that. Believe it or not, your pastor used to be a collector. So at this time, I was doing my own financing. Gentleman comes in, finds a ring for his soon-to-be fiance. Um, didn't have a lot of money to put down, but got to talking to the guy. It seemed like I trust this guy. It seemed to be a good guy. So I allowed him to finance about 70% of the ring. Guy paid like clockwork for the first year. Never had an issue. And then all of a sudden one day, I didn't get a payment. And the next month, I didn't get a payment. But then the next month, he calls me. And he tells me, he says, man, I'm really struggling right now. Lost my job. And he said, uh, I can't make a payment, man. He's like, I apologize. He said, do you want the ring back? I said, no. I said, you take care of your family. Get back on your feet. Start paying me when you do. So he finds another job just a few months later. It didn't take him long. And he started paying again like clockwork. Did phenomenal. Paid the account off. Came back in. Bought something for Christmas for his wife. Again, some struggles came up. He reached out to me again. And then he caught back up. Everything looked pretty good. All of a sudden, and it was a lot of money. I didn't hear from him. Months went by. I ran into somebody that knew this guy. And at the time, of course, I'm not real happy. You know, that was my before pastor days. Okay, there wasn't much mercy there. And I'm visiting with this guy, and I said, Hey, man, can you tell me what such and such is doing? He said, Micah, he passed away. He had passed away in a fatal accident. And it was right at the time that he quit paying. So I immediately went back to the store. I'm getting choked up now because I knew the guy. He's a great guy. I reached out to his wife and I sent her a letter. I didn't call her. I sent her a letter. And in that letter, I pardoned the entire bill. I said, there's no way I'm going to make you pay this. You've got too much to worry about as it is. You've got your kids to take care of and so forth. The reason I bring this story up, this has nothing to do with me and my mercy, okay? Because before I became a pastor, I was not a very merciful person. Here's what happens. When you give mercy, God gives mercy back. When you give mercy, you get into God's favor, okay? That lady has come back to the store and has spent plenty of money, not only her, but his mother, her family, multiple of his friends found out what we did, even though we did it silently, we didn't want anybody to know, and they spent a lot of money in the store. Now, again, this is not about money. I'm trying to show you guys. By showing mercy, God said, hey, by you doing that, here you go. Always show mercy, guys. When you have that opportunity, you got to do it. Okay? I want you to think about this, guys. Mercy is needed when misery is present. Think about that. Mercy is needed when misery is present. Distress, pain, struggle, failure, those scenarios create the environment for mercy. In that environment, you are either seeking mercy, or better yet, you have the opportunity to give mercy. When I was growing up playing football, I got uh, in, in a game, we were playing uh, real close at the end of the game, it was fourth quarter, and uh, I had a coach that was really hard on me, really, really hard on me in practice, games, so forth. And uh, anyway, so we're driving at the end of the game. There's less than a minute left. We've got first and goal at like the five-yard line. We're down by four points. We're fixing to drive in and score, okay? On that play, I'll never forget, I got up to the line, and I heard the quarterback kind of audible, but I couldn't figure out exactly who I was supposed to block, and I started looking up. Well, I didn't see it, but there was a blitzing linebacker standing on the other side that I was supposed to pull out and catch. I didn't see him. I missed my block. Now, I'm not saying this, that I wasn't the greatest player, but I was a pretty good player. I didn't miss a lot of blocks. That was pretty good. But, but I missed that block. And not only did I miss the block, he creamed my quarterback, and my quarterback fumbled, and they recovered. The game's over, right? I'm walking to the sidelines thinking, this coach is fixing to rip me a new one, right? Like, 
I left my helmet on. Like, I was really scared. Like, I'm thinking he's fixing to seriously just come unglued. And he was that type of coach. He chewed tobacco on the sidelines. So when he'd get in your face, he'd bring you real close, and he'd scream at you, and he'd just spit tobacco all over your face. Yeah, that happened a lot. So, so like, I'm sitting there, and, and that was before, like, shields. Like, you didn't get them shields on your helmet like you get nowadays. So I'm, I'm thinking the whole time, not only is he going to chew me out, but I'm going to have to taste this tobacco. It's just gross. It's nasty. So anyway, I get to the sideline. And he's looking at me. He's just staring at me the whole time, just like this right here. And I knew not to go away from him because he's just going to chase me down. I knew, I, listen, I'm a big boy. I made a mistake. I'm going to face it. So I walk right to him. Walk up to him. He looks right at me, and he said, you played a really good game. And he turned around and walked off. Guys, the greatest time to show mercy is in those moments. Those moments that you know people are working so hard and they're, they're really trying to get through, but failure happens. That's not when you come down on somebody. That's when you show mercy. You, show, you come down on them when they continue to make the same mistake over and over again, right? It's like children, okay? Like your kids. You know, your kids keep doing things wrong. You, you beat them. Well, not beat them. They didn't sound good. <laughs> you discipline your kids. Don't spare the rod. But if you think about it, your kid makes one little mistake, you know, you let it go. They make it for the first time. You let it go. You know, you, you point it out, but you show mercy. Amen? Okay. One other thing, guys, I just want to point this out from this story. I was really hard on myself after that game. I was really beat up. One of the toughest people to show mercy to is yourself. Make sure you do that. I want to go to Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through 32. Get your Bibles out and get there. We're going to discuss the prodigal son, the lost son. This is Jesus telling this story. I love this story. And a lot of y'all know this story. But here's the thing. There's some cool things he showed me when I was reading it this past week that I want to point out. Amen when you get there. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. Y'all all good Christians today. Y'all getting there quick. Uh, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there... He wasted all his money in wild living. In today's world, that young rich man, he's a spoiled brat. He decided to go live in Vegas. That's basically what he decided to do. Y'all get the picture? Okay. Pick back up on verse 14. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him. And the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding, the pigs looked good to him. That's disgusting. But no one gave him anything. So in other words, the junk that the pigs were eating looked good to him. That's how much he was starving. Now, how many of y'all, show of hands, have seen a pig eat? Okay. Have you seen what the pigs eat? Okay. Okay. When he finally came to his senses, okay, in one translation it says when he finally came to his right mind, when it says this, guys, I need you to understand, he was obviously not in his right mind. See, that's when mercy comes in. It's when you realize that you've been in the wrong mindset. That's when you need it the most. You usually figure it out. I'm not in the right mindset here. Okay, well, if you're not in the right mindset, you probably just made a lot of mistakes before that. So this is when mercy starts to come in. How many of us have been the same way? I want you to think about it. Some of you may have uh, had fun the night before, okay? And then the next morning you realize mercy was needed. And, and for some of y'all, that mercy may be called Tylenol or ibuprofen. I'm just saying, not your pastor, that's some of y'all. Y'all notice I said some of y'all. That's the thing, again, guys, when mercy is needed is when it's those situations when you finally wake up and realize you made those mistakes, okay? Let's continue on. I'm getting somewhere. 
uh, we're back 17, when he finally came to his right mind, his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food good enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father, and I will say to my father, I have sinned against you, both you and heaven, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me as one of your hired servants. I want you to notice something here, guys. I want you to pick up on what it says happened once he came to his right mind. He thought of his father. Again, how many times do we do that? We don't do things right. We do things with the wrong mindset. And the first thing we think about is, oh, God. Right? I mean, again, it's kind of like how many times have you woke up the next morning from something you didn't need to be doing? You wake up, you got a bad headache, you don't feel good, and you're like, oh, God, please help. Seriously, think about it. That's what he's doing in this moment. We make bad decisions in life when mercy is needed. We, we are so quick to call out God instead of trying to stay on the right path. I want to pick back up verse 20. So he, turned, so he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. All right, notice here the son did not see the father. The father saw the son. God's always looking for us. The son never saw the father. It was a ways off, but the father, I want you to get this, I want you to catch this. No matter how messed up you are, God is always looking for you to come back home. That's what Jesus is telling in this story. Go back to, where are we at here? Verse 21. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring from his finger, excuse me, get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For his son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Notice before the son could even ask his father to be a servant, his father interrupts and says, we've got to have a party to celebrate my son who was lost and now is found. He didn't even get the word servant out of his mouth because his merciful father was ready to bring him right back. And I also want you to notice where it says that he gave him a ring. In some translations, it says that it was a signet ring. Being in the jewelry business, if you don't know what the signet ring is, a signet ring is something that a lot of families did where it had, like nowadays, a lot of them will make it with like initials on it or their last name on it, or they've got some kind of crest, some kind of symbol that they put on this ring, and it's the family ring. So this father is already telling him, that not only does he not give him an opportunity to ask to be a servant, but he says, we're fixing to have a party, and guess what? You're still part of my family. I'm going to put this ring on your finger. You're still part of this family. After he has squandered all his money in Vegas at the slot machines. And Lord knows who were else. That would be a cool way to end this story. But Jesus continues. He knew there was another part that needed to be explained. See, there was a second son, a much wiser and a much better looking son we'll call him Micah <laughs> and then we're, we're going to call this one that screws up all the time we're, we're going to I don't know Bojo <laughs> just going to do that we're going to continue the story we're going to hear what Bojo had to say verse 25 meanwhile the older son was in the fields working you're the older son by the way you the... no 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 you're the young I'm the older I'm sorry I got mixed up I'm the older much wiser much better looking son. So meanwhile, Micah is in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants, what was going on? Your brother's back. He was told your father has killed the fatted calf. We're celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was very angry and would not go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I've slaved for you. 
and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one goat for a feast with my friends. Yet, when Bojo comes back, after squandering all your money on prostitutes, You celebrate by killing the fatted calf. Okay, well, see, <laughs> the second son, he's a little upset, right? Like, I'll be, I'm a little upset here. And he says, why Bojo? He gets to have this party after all this stuff. The whole time I've been here taking care of so forth. I mean, who do you think actually fattened the calf, right? Because, like, he ain't been here. Like, I'm, I'm the one been taking care of the cow. I'm the one been feeding the cow. But you're going to give the cow to Bojo, who's been doing God knows what in Vegas. Like, that didn't make any sense to, to the younger, to, to the older wiser, better looking brother, right? So <laughs> I'm not done. Go to verse 31. His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost. But now he's found. How many times is that us, guys? Wanting justice. You know, I wanted justice, right? It's not fair. I'm the one doing all the work. I'm the one sitting here. But the problem is, is we seem to always want justice when God wants mercy. We've got to ask God. God, in this situation, what do you want me to do? Is this a time that I need to come down hard on my brother? Or is this the time that I need to sit back and celebrate that he's back on the right path for right now? I need you to understand something. Mercy is very strong, and it is good to give this mercy, but at the same time, we have a problem, and I'm seeing this as Christian brothers and sisters. When our brother or sister messes up, you mark my spot. When our brother and sister mess up, we have the tendency of getting them back on the right path, but then there's no discipling afterwards. We can't do that. You're crippling them. Show mercy, get them on the right path, and then stick right there with them and pull them through it. Don't let them get off path, guys, because guess what? If they get off path again, there's a good chance mercy's not at the end of that path. Bojo, by the way, he's doing good, so <laughs> mercy kicked in. And that's the thing, that's a typical hypocritical Christian. We've all been there. If you, if you say that you haven't been there, then you're lying to me, where you say, you know, we mess up and go straight to God and beg for mercy, but when we see someone else do bad, we immediately want justice. We all, we've all been there. You can't, again, don't sit here and lie to me. We've all been there. The main point of this story that I need you all to get Jesus is trying to get this across to you guys. If you come back to me and humble yourself before me, this is Jesus speaking, I can turn misery into mercy. So how does God separate our sins when we humble ourselves before him? I want to go to Psalms 103.12. We just read this a minute ago. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The east and the west never meet, guys. It never meets. That's how far he has thrown them out the door. He's casted them in the sea. I want to go to Psalms 103, 17. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children. My boy Ryan was talking about this a minute ago. We've talked about this so many times as legacies. The more mercy that you show, the more love you'll receive, and the more you can pass that down from generation to generation. If you're stubborn and you're hard-headed and you want nothing but justice 24-7 and you don't listen to the Spirit when He's trying to tell you to show mercy... Your children will see that. Not only that, you're probably treating your children that way. Ryan, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I guarantee you a lot of those children continue on that same path. 
it's hard to get them back on track, right? It's our jobs, mothers and fathers, grandparents, show mercy. I had one grandmother that showed a lot of mercy, and I had one grandmother that was straight up truth and justice, and I never wanted to go to that grandmother's house. <laughs> I wanted to go to the other one's house. I mean, I literally climbed over a fence one time, and she beat me like a dog right out there in the yard. Like, people were driving by honking and laughing. And I'm like, this ain't funny. Like, I was getting beat up by my grandma, and I was running from her, and that, that old woman was fast. Like, she caught me. But think about it. Seriously, think about it. If, if it's straight up just truth and justice and just always on you, it... You don't want to be around that person. You want to be around the one that you know you can make a mistake and they'll still love you and they'll teach you and they'll guide you. By the way, not that this grandmother didn't teach and guide. She just had a different way of doing it. <laughs> Loved her to death. Miss her tremendously. Whatever mercy you are wanting God to give you, you need to give that same mercy to others. Let's go to James 2.13. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. In other words, he's going to show mercy to those who give mercy. About four months ago, it hadn't been that long, three months ago, me and Amanda and the kids went to Dallas and uh, instead of getting a hotel room, we decided we we're going to get one of those Airbnbs, you know, get our own little place or whatever. So Amanda's looking online. I gave her a budget. So this is kind of where we need to stay, you know, right in this area right here. And, and we ended up in the hood. But, but the thing is, she told me, she's like, yeah, it's going to be this much and so forth. Well, we, we get there. Airbnb's a little different. You, you don't receive a bill at first, so forth. It's kind of tr weird. I don't like how they do it. But anyway, so when it was all over with, and I get home, I get an email from Airbnb, and I see the bill, and, and, and it, ain't, it ain't the budget. It's not even close to the budget, okay? So I'm looking at it, and I'm like, she never does this. Like, what is going on? So I reach out to Amanda, and uh, she says, Micah, she said, I'm, I, I'm telling you, that's what the price was. I know that's what the price was. You know, it wasn't that much. I know it wasn't that much. So we go back, and we look at it. She had looked at the weekday price and not the weekend price, which was about double the price. But you know what? My wife don't make mistakes, so I showed a lot of mercy. <laughs> Amen? I said, baby, that's all right. That's not a problem. Not a problem. Uh, I want to give you guys five ways that you can show mercy to others. These are five things that I've come up with. Be patient with people. Very important. Who in here has to be patient with me? Put your hand down. <laughs> Give people a second chance. Be good to those that hurt you. Be kind to those that offend you. And then pray for all the above. If you can do that, man, there will be no drama in your life. If you can do these things right here, if you can give somebody a second chance, if you can be patient, if you can be good to those that hurt you, be kind to those that offend you, there's no need for them to be upset at you. You can go to sleep at night without the drama of you doing something wrong. You can go to sleep with pure peace. That's what I want for this church. I want this church to be able to go to sleep at night and not have to have a worry in their mind about something they said that day to somebody or some way that they wronged someone or that they gossiped. Be nice. That's a lot of peace. Get a good night's sleep that way. That's what I want for this church. I want to end with the story to explain the difference between our mercy and God's mercy. I want you to imagine that you knew a criminal who was going to be put on death row. On top of that, this same guy had terminal cancer. He had no money, no family, and a criminal record that would never allow him to get a job. This man one day gets a call from the governor. The governor says, you've been forgiven of all 
that you've committed and you're pardoned. So the man is free, right? But he's going to die in six months. He's got terminal cancer. He has no family, and he can't get a job because of his criminal record. But he was pardoned by the governor, and he's free. It's a good story, but here's the difference. I want you to imagine this. That same man gets a call from the same governor saying again, you've been forgiven, you've been pardoned. But the governor tells him, when you walk out the door, there's going to be a limo waiting for you outside. In this limo is the doctor that has come up with the cure for your terminal cancer. The limo is going to drive you to my mansion where I'm going to adopt you as my family and you will be a part of my family for the rest of your life. I'll also wipe your state, state, excuse me, slate clean and there will be no record of the crimes that you have committed so you can then get a job in my administration and work with my team for the rest of your life. That's mercy. There's a difference there, right? You see the difference? Grab a pen and paper. Let y'all write this down. The bad son over here is not grabbing any pen and paper. It's messed up, man. You're just a, you're just a rebel. Like, seriously. <laughs> I knew he'd like that. All right, go ahead, Dustin. Oh, never mind. You already got it. I'm sorry, man. I, I, I waited too long. Mercy is greater than forgiveness. The first story with the governor and the pardon, that's forgiveness. The second story, that's mercy. Mercy is greater than forgiveness, guys. You can forgive people all day long. You can. You can forgive them, but can you show mercy on top of that? That's what's hard. It's almost like the forgiving part's not as, it's, it's not that, you know, everybody said, man, it's hard to forgive. No, it's hard to give mercy. That's what's hard. You can forgive people. You know why you can forgive people? Because you know that's what you're supposed to do, right? You're supposed to show mercy, too. That's the hard part. Especially when people continue to make those same mistakes, guys. And again, I need y'all to understand today, because I know some of you are looking at me and you're like, but Micah, people are just going to walk all over me. No, that's not what I'm saying. God doesn't want people to walk all over you. He wants us to be bold. But there's times to be bold and there's times to be meek. You need to know the difference. How do you know the difference? You pray about it. You listen to the Spirit. Follow your heart. He'll let you know. He'll let you know when it's time to be merciful. And he'll let you know when it's time to be bold. I can say it because I've lived it. Have that connection with the Holy Spirit so you can hear that. It's very important. 